we, we've been looking in a little mini-series at where God came face to face with various people in the Bible. And we tell ourselves perhaps, well, if I wish I could see Jesus, how happy I'd be. But we've seen that those who did meet with God met under his terms, not ours. Sometimes we do need lifting up, encouraging, blessed, but sometimes we need putting right. So engaging in, su in such, we find out where we need putting right as well as getting encouragement. We saw Didion energized to destroy the pagan altar that his father had built when he'd rather be hiding in a threshing floor. Or Jacob engaged in a wrestling match. Abraham on a rescue mission for his nephew and so on. We like to think that we're getting nearer to God than as we do that. Outbursts of joy will be on our lips. Something like, uh, well, that old chorus, I'm H-A-P-P-Y. Well, hopefully something a bit more literate than that, but uh, at least it spells. But when we look at the list of Old Testament saints in Hebrews, as we've recently, a few moments ago, read. What do we read of? H-A-P-P-Y? We read of death, torture, before the bursting forth of faith and a glorious future. Our lives are usually a great mix of elation and of struggle, of joy and sadness. I take as my guide the book by... Krish Kandaya, God is stranger, God is different from what we might expect. He has his own ways of doing things. Krish recently spoke at uh, St Mary's Church in Chesham. God isn't our puppet to do what we consider he should do. God's ways aren't our ways. We don't, at least at first, understand why God should allow or initiate certain actions. Why is he allowing all this problem in Israel and Gaza? Right across the world, why doesn't he step in and change things? Well, we're going to look at part of the life of David, especially as the composer of many psalms. We read right, uh, we, sorry, we sang right from the very beginning, Psalm 23, basically. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. All very positive. And then, well, he guides me along the right paths, yes. For his name's sake, might not be what I wanted. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Well, that surely is not what I want from a God, but I'm not driving God. God is the one who is fulfilling things for me. You prepare a table before me, lovely, in the presence of my enemies. Well, Generally speaking, it's quite an idyllic scene. Quiet waters, green fields, but there are those dark shadows and dark valleys. The enemies are around, but God is there, guiding, protecting with his rod and his staff, setting a table for us. Honoured guests, talks about anointing our head with oil, as is done for the honoured guest. A wonderful residence, house of the Lord. I wonder how this really fitted in with David's experience. The writers don't often tell the whole truth. And he had a very up and down life. 
he had a background of a lad looking for sheep, as we read, when his older brothers go off to war. But he had an errand to deliver their lunch. And he came across this uh, giant Goliath. Now Jesse had said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and ten loaves of brother bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some insurance from them. I, I like the fact that uh, Jesse was a, a man of wisdom. He made sure the uh, commanders were looking after his uh, his two his sons there by giving them a little set of uh, a little present of uh, cheeses. And here was David, part of the family that was going to lead, of course, to our saviour. But looking back, he was uh, part of a family. Jesse was uh, was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz in the story of Ruth. And Jesse was his son, the son of Obed. And so Boaz was David's great-grandfather. David just the lunch boy. But we know the story how David offered to fight Goliath. One commentator, Riley, says, David didn't kill Goliath because he set out to slay giants. He set out to give sandwiches to his brothers, but Goliath got in the way. He was ready. Having those skirmishes with bears and lions had prepared him. But he and Saul fell out fairly soon afterwards. And an overview of David's life will reveal some sad and less than good side to his character. But in the beginning, he knew where his safety lay. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. He had confidence in God's good hand, a firm trust in God. And we know of his future prowess, defeating Philistines, recapturing Jerusalem from the Jebusites and so on. But Krish Kandaya comments that David had other battles with himself. Sometimes on occasion, God's help was not so forthcoming. What do we do with a God who used to turn up, help us, and now doesn't, who feels more like a stranger? Too often we remember those top of the mountain experiences when God seemed very near. Or when we've seen God's hand at work in a special way in our lives or in the lives of others. But today, well, today is just today. There's nothing special about it. Or worse, perhaps we're facing problems that we've not dealt with before. It might be health change in circumstances where we need guidance, family upsets, despair when we see loved ones turn away from God, prayers that bounce back from the ceiling. Later, God, David was to know God was with him even when on the run, even when he had to plead for forgiveness. Was he always confident? Lord, where are you now? Giants are easier to fight, defeat than inner doubts. We read Psalm 23, a well-known psalm. But there are a lot of psalms that don't get read. 
because they don't give such a rosy picture. Let's read part of one of them, Psalm 69. Save me, God, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there's no foothold. I can't have come into the deep waters that floods engulf me. I'm worn out for crawling for help. My throat is parched, my eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without a reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many of the enemies without a cause who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. But his enemies don't seem to be those who knew about his particular guilt, whatever it might have been. They were just out to get him, to make him fall. Well, a lot of the Psalms have a heading and this had a tune to it. The tune was called Lilies. Sounds nice and uh, soothing piece of music. We don't know what it really sounded like. But what turmoil there were in the words. And who wrote those words? David. David, the man said, who said, the Lord is my shepherd, says, my eyes are full at fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. He's had troubles like falling into a, a muddy lake. It all seemed to be too much to bear. All he sees is the enemy. Where is God? Giants can be easier to defeat than inner doubts. Why so many enemies? Why so many things happening to me? What have, what have they got against me? He rec recognises some of his own folly, his own guilt. But that's not always so. God doesn't seem to be there and we can't think of what we might have done to offend him. Well, God may be just hovering by the door, waiting for us to see if we take notice that he's not there. Sometimes our problems come tumbling in and we feel we can't cope. Do we look for God when the mist or even the dark rolls in? Just uh, family matters. Uh, my wife had a uh, small car crash. Somebody backed into her car and shortly afterwards, walking along the street, she broke her hip and has had a hip replacement. My car had a blown tire and I spent a night in hospital after a fall. And these gave opportunities for others to be kind and helpful. Not perhaps what we would have wanted, but God can bring good out of evil. That psalm we read part of goes on, Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put shame because of me, for I endured scorn for your sake and shame covered my face. David sees that what he does Others will see well, how he responds to God's pardon, pattern for his life is going to affect his evidence, his way of showing out that he is God's person. David feels out of his depths, abandoned, but that doesn't stop him crying out to God. He's concerned for God's honour. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. He prays that 
from the problems will come honour to God. And those who seek to belittle God just find themselves deflected onto his people. For the zeal of your house consumes me and the insults of those who insult fall on me. How true it be that when at the cross the call was in Matthew 27. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. To those, this was just a miscarriage of justice. But many, many, many have been saved because of the fact that he took our punishment upon him. David might feel abandoned and attacked, but he still cries out to God. See how he cares for the honour of God. For the zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. He's on depression, but he doesn't stop calling on the Lord. He doesn't want the impact of his situation to rebound back on others. He fears his difficulties might want others to give up. What happens when things go wrong in our life? Who do we blame? Do we have that little feeling that, that why isn't God looking after me? I'm supposed to be his. Or are we looking to bring good out of what appears at first to be evil and wrong. The writer of Hebrews 11, which we read, we heard, read of many persecutions, had a spur to hold others fast. There were those others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that it might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. Put to death by stoning, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The writer of the Hebrews is looking back across the Old Testament and many others who don't appear by name in the Old Testament and all the problems and persecutions that they put up with. And it hasn't gone away. It's gone worse. The uh, list of countries where it is you forbidden or persecuted if you're a Christian seems to grow every year. The writer of the Hebrews realizes they were all condemned, commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised because God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. When things go wrong in our life, do we face it as if it was attack on us our problem or do we see it as our problem those around us how do i deal with it how can i bring honor and glory to god some people need real encouragement when faced with opposition it's not a game reality hits different people in different ways for some you get a sore if you rub hard. For others, you get thick skin. What is needed is fortitude, stickability. At Newtown, we're uh, studying a book called Belong, about belonging to a church and how we should work together and how we should support each other and how we should be those who demonstrate together that God is God and the Lord is Lord. And part of the book 
has a little um, table reminding us of some, it emphasizes some, of the verses in the New Testament which talk about each other. John 13, love one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, build one another up. Colossians 3, bear with one another. Ephesians 4, forgive one another. Galatians 5, serve one another. Romans 12, be devoted one to another. James 5, pray for one another. Colossians 3, teach one another. Romans 12, live in harmony with one another. Ephesians 5, submit to one another. Romans 12, honour one another. Romans 15, welcome one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, encourage one another. And Hebrews 3, exhort one another. How united are we as a fellowship of those who are supporting, who are working together, who understand each other, who can bear up each other and bear with each other. Being a Christian is not a one-man game. It's being part of a group of people who know and love each other, our, our Saviour. We need to support each other without being intrusive. David continues he, in his Psalm 69. As a prophet, he prefigures the Saviour. How are we ready to do so after what he did for us? Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I'm in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I'm disgorned, disgraced, shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I look for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar to drink. How this prefigures our Saviour on the cross. Vinegar for my thirst. Here is David being inspired to utter words that Jesus will re-echo on the cross. Compare those words to David's about green pastures. That same person may at times feel the presence of the shepherd is now feeling abandoned. He admits he needs God's great mercy coming from the goodness of his love. The darkest valleys have an ending. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How often do we know, really know, that God's great mercy and love through Jesus surrounds us? David knew he needed mercy. He's aware of when he sinned. He's aware that God hides his face from him, but he knows who he can look for for help and forgiveness. He can't find real reconciliation with his enemies. In fact, they only turn to try and make things worse. Bitter gall, acid vinegar. How do we deal with those who seemingly have wronged us? Pour on vinegar or pour in balm? And in fact, David calls down wrath upon his enemies. May the table set before them become a snare. May it be a retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. 
Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let no one dwell in their tents. Should a Christian really say this? Maybe we pretend that we're just asking for justice. But if so, where is the mercy which we, along with them, need? Krish Kandaya quotes from uh, Walter Brugman, who noticed, notes that we're offended by such sentiments finding their way into the Bible. He feel that but believers shouldn't feel this way, but supposing we do, our response might be one of three things. Feeling we need justice, show no mercy, as far as possible act on this, but, but vengeance belongs to the Lord. Do not take vengeance, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, Romans 12. Or deny the feelings, bury them, but such strong emotions can, call, can burst out elsewhere. Does a dog get the anger that we should be lying out for someone else? Or do we place the situation in God's hand? Is our motion controlled by a spiritual need? The Psalms have resources to help us work out how to respond to even most difficult aspects of life. Ignore the problem and we rob ourselves of help to live in a complex and a difficult world. David at least didn't seek to directly injure the oppressors, but left it to God to do it. Vengeance is transferred from the heart of the speaker to the heart of God, said Walter Brugman. David's a complex character, but not too complex for an all-seeing God. The remainder of Psalm 69, David has worked through his vengeful vengeful spirit and turns to see and seek God. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with its horns and hooves. The poor will be glad, will see and be glad. Those who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and doesn't despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them, for God will see, save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. The people will settle there and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. Are things going wrong in your life? Are there problems of people or things how do we respond to it? Do we respond in a praiseful way to a God who has the future in his hands? Or do we bristle, bristle and strike out? Is it conflict or blessings that we want to see in our lives? Our last hymn is number 379. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. The king, his kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall rise and set no more. And he reigns not just in the universe, but he should reign in our hearts. Let us take heed for what David had to learn. <laughs> 